I'm Peter Cook in Washington. Welcome to Money and Politics, and thanks for watching. Well, lots more to come on today's edition of Money and Politics. First, America's population boom lit the 300 million mark next week. Is it a cause for celebration? Or should the country be worried by that? Well, in 1967, the U.S. population hit the 200 million mark. Now, nearly 40 years later, the U.S. housing 100 million more people. But is bigger, better? We'll debate that next here on Money and Politics. It's just about official. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, this coming Tuesday at 7.36 a.m., the population of the United States will hit the 300 million mark. But a rising population brings new domestic challenges, including questions of whether the economy can handle that growth. Some say that bigger doesn't necessarily mean better. Here to discuss these issues, William Fry, demographer with the Brookings Institution and the University of Michigan, and Roy Beck, the executive director of Numbers USA. Thanks to both of you gentlemen. And I will start with you, Mr. Fry, if I could. Uh, your take on these numbers. First of all, do you buy it? Are we really going to hit the 300 million mark next Tuesday? And what's the significance? Well, I think close to next Tuesday. The Census Bureau says 7.46 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, that may be a little too precise statistically, but I'll, I'll say that around that time we're going to be 300 million. I think it's an important a benchmark. I think the fact that we're the third biggest country in the world is something people don't know, and I think it should be trumpeted. I think how we're getting there as quickly as we are has to do with the fact that we're moving into kind of a new melting pot America that we are now uh, have accounted for through immigration and the children of immigrants, uh, a larger part of the population growth. This has both pros and cons, but I think the pros outweigh the cons because it means that we're going to continue to grow, it continues that we're going to be more of a younger population than we, we would have otherwise with all the aging baby boomers who never had that many kids anyway. And uh, we're going to have a more diverse population, which eventually will make us more connected with the rest of the world. Mr. Becker, your take on this, is it significant? Is it a good thing? It's very significant, and it's, it's a very sad day. I think uh, many of us, in fact, as most Americans, according to polls, hope that we would never get to this day. Uh, they, they, during the 1970s, there was a large public discussion about whether we would want to add the third hundred million people, and most people decided, no, we didn't want to. And polls have shown ever since then that Americans don't want to see this kind of rapid population growth. Uh, we were connected with a poll that was just released last week that shows that two-thirds of Americans feel that this l rate of population growth is definitely making their quality of life worse. So this is a, this is a milestone of government coerced population growth because it's been done by raising immigration versus what the American people really wanted. Let's look at this from the economic perspective, because there has been debate over this. Doesn't the increase in population and the increase in population in immigrants coming to this country bolster the U.S. economy over time, at least going forward? Well, it bolsters the GNP, but the real question for a democratic society is what does it do for the average person? What does it do per capita? And, and, and it's, it's, it, it, many of the uh, uh, indicators suggest that it has helped in some ways. It's not helped in others. But it is important to know that in economy, the people who are a part of that account economy have quality of life. And it's not just the money and how big the GNP is, but it's also do they like the congestion, the added congestion in their lives, the traffic, the crowded schools, the fact that it's so difficult for them to have personal mobility to have respite by leaving town on the weekend, for example. Well, Mr. Fry, let me get your take on this. You mentioned an issue certainly has been highlighted as baby boomers retire. Who is it who's going to provide the goods and services to keep the economy running? Who's going to support those folks as they head into retirement? Isn't it the immigrant population? Well, I think immigrants and their children have made the population younger. Over the last 100 million people uh, we've had added to the population since 1967, about 53 percent of that gains have come from immigrants and their children, and it's helped to make the population age structure a lot younger than it otherwise would be. I think in addition, though, to this kind of demographic balance, these people come in and they're much more energetic. If you think back at the immigrants at the turn of the previous century, they came here with this can-do work attitude. They were happy to be here, to move themselves up. They were aspirational. For the second half of the 20th century, we were very inward looking. We were prosperous, of course, but it was a post-war prosperity that didn't last for most of those decades. Now we need some more of this kind of uh, a can-do attitude in the part of people coming to this country. And I think along with just the numbers, we have this new attitude, which really goes back to our history as being a nation of immigrants. 
Mr. Beck, let me ask you, uh, the, a lot of people have made uh, uh, comparisons to Europe and to Japan, for example, where the population uh, increases are, are not, in fact, uh, keeping pace with the United States, and that's posing some economic problems for them in the future. Uh, are, isn't the United States in a relatively envious position here? No, I, I think what would make us envious is if we had a rather stable population or if we had a slow growth. But this kind of rapid growth, we basically have been importing poverty with, uh, with immigration nearly all all of our increase in the rise of the uninsured, nearly all of our increase in poverty can be accounted for uh, within the immigrant populations, both the immigrants and their children. Uh, this is, th we were doing fine in the 50s and 60s and 70s when we had low immigration. In fact, we were doing great. Uh, it's true immigration has just barely reduced our, our average age, but all of these immigrants are going to get old too. Uh, every nation in the world basically needs to be able to handle its own, its, its own economy its own jobs. Uh it's good to have a reciprocal relationship and when you got people moving in and out of the country, Americans going other places, uh, other people coming working here, but we don't need to have the federal government forcing this kind of massive population growth at this time. Americans overwhelmingly would like for the federal government to stop. Unfortunately, even if the government uh, forbid forbade all immigration the rest of the century, we would still be growing. So we'll never get, none of us will ever see a situation like Europe where we would have a stable population or a declining one. Uh, Mr. Fry, let me ask you about uh, some, some more numbers here. Where are these people going? Where are they all living? Well, uh, the fastest growing parts of the country are the southeast and the west. And I think you, you get a, a misinterpretation of what growth is if you happen to live in Phoenix or if you happen to live in Orlando. If you lived in Detroit or near Detroit, where I spend a lot of time, you don't get the feeling that you're overwhelmed with growth. Or if you live in Buffalo, you don't get the feeling that you're overwhelmed with growth. Part of this is a distributional issue. And uh, one area where maybe there's a common ground between Roy and I is I don't, I don't necessarily advocate that we keep our current immigration policy planted out into the future. I think we could be more strategic about bringing immigrants in here who we think can contribute more to the labor force, maybe on the basis of skills rather than family origin, uh, or at least balance that a little bit more. So I think we need to, over time, reassess who we're bringing in and how it, assess, how it sort of sinks in with the labor market and our needs. That we really haven't done with our immigration policy. But I don't think it's the numbers of people. It's who we bring in, and I think we need to think a little more about that as we continue to grow through immigration. Mr. Beck, your, your take on that. We've had a lot of companies, a lot of CEOs come through here talk about the need for this H-1B visa for those people, engineers who might be uh, learning a, a skill in, in another country, want to come to the United States. We should let those people in. What do you make of that argument? Well, the government policy should always be for its own people first, so that we should have an H-1B program that has guarantees that American engineers and American programmers are truly get the first shot and the best shot at these jobs. We don't have that kind of program now. Now, we might be able to have a higher number of visas, but at this point, the corporate world has not been not been willing to put those kind of guarantees into law. So at this point, I would say, no, we don't need more H-1Bs because we have no assurance that the ones that are coming are truly needed. And, and I would also say that, that it, in terms of employee satisfaction, what it takes to get to work, you know, what it, take, what it takes to keep employees happy with their lives, it really does make a difference in terms of the numbers. And what the polling that was released last week showed that when you divide the United States into nine regions of the country, people in the Great Plains states were almost as much opposed to using immigration for, for, high, immigra for high population growth as those in the mid-Atlantic area. So it's not just a question of how congested you are, it's a question about do you want to be more congested than you are right now. And all of these have to do with, with the, the happiness of people who are working units of the national economy. Mr. Fry, just a couple seconds left here. How soon do we get to 400 million? Uh, 2043, unless Roy has his way, uh, <laughs> is where we're likely to be headed, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's possible, it's quite possible we could never see that, and that's what, what we hope. Uh, Roy Beck, William Fry, thank you both very much. Interesting topic. We'll wait to see who it is, number 300 million on Tuesday.